Hey, welcome to another trip of down memory lane with uh, Badger's Heavy Hitters here. I have a dear friend of mine, Chad. Uh, we're gonna, this is my friend Chad. Chad, thank you for coming on the show tonight. Thank you for inviting me, brother. So, uh, so Chad's story, let me just say this to those that are out there. You know, like, we're a recovery station as well as, you know, I, a lot of you guys are coming over from Fresh Out and... You know, my story just happens to have lots of institution in it. Not everybody's story does. Sometimes it's homelessness, gang banging, uh, whatever the case may be. You know, human trafficking, being prostituted, you know, all the above. And I've been involved in just about every aspect of it. I'd rather be real and rejected than fake and accepted, you know? That's how we pretty much run in our car, right? That's, mm -hmm. you know, we're family at... Uh, we're a family of understanding like we understand that we've all been down the same road and you know Drugs were the solution in our case, you know, what I mean because of our behaviors and whatnot, you know drugs and alcohol, so um, I believe the majority of Chad's story is Alcohol, am I right? Well, there's a lot of drug use. There's a lot of drug too. goods uh, right. Before my uh, first recovery, but then during my relapse it, it, it evolved into strictly alcohol because I was afraid to kick heroin again you know, I kicked, heroin, I kicked heroin cold turkey. I had no idea what Subutex and Suboxone was. And when I kicked heroin, it was dead-ass cold turkey. Nothing and nice about it. No. I figured out where the majority of my trolls are coming from. You know, when I was in the county jail fighting my case, I caught a sodomy in there. And, you know, I had been down so long that I got it dropped down to tailgating, and I think they're still upset about it. As far as my viewers go, man, I love you. Nothing but love and respect to you, you know. I'm about a story. So basically what we do is we give a little background as to how we grew up. You know what I mean? Were we involved in this, that, whatever your story may be, I can't tell it for you. So and, uh, she was able to go backstage, and uh, she met a gentleman that was a tour manager for this band. And uh, they hit it off really well, and they made very good friends. He traveled her through the country a couple times to visit, you know, when they were out on tour. And it actually became that, you know, she came out here to visit him in California uh, one Christmas. And when she came home, she said, we're moving to California. And I think I was five years old at the time, and it took about six months for all that to go down. I had to finish my school year. And uh, actually my semester, um, you know, second grade is when all this went down. And uh, I was so young, I had no idea what I was about to get myself into, where I was going. You know, this was all a very foreign thing to me. Uh, you know, come day of my last day of school, everybody knew I was moving to California. They had a birthday, or not a birthday party. They had a going away party for me at the school. And my great grandmother showed up and my dad showed up. and. There was a lot of tears involved and that's where it kind of hit home that this was maybe not you know exactly what i knew it was going to be because there was sadness involved uh, you know long story short you know i came to california in the the, the winter break of summer and uh or winter and f spring semester of second grade and i moved into woodland hills california and that became my new home you know and i'm a you know i think five or six Approaching six or something like that at the time. I'm just a little country boy. You know what I mean? I had nothing about the fast life. Welcome uh, to the jungle. Huh? Right? You know, immediately. And, you know, I made friends with my neighbor across the street. And, you know, I grew up a really good kid. And, you know, fast forwarding to, uh, to where all the goods are at and where they're involved. Uh, you know, I made a solid foundation in Woodland Hills, and I, you know, I had a very large group of friends, but, you know, being that young, we don't have cars, we don't have, you know, ways to get around and this and that, and I ended up moving into Chatsworth, and I lost touch with all those friends, and once again, I'm having to build myself a new database of friends, you know, going to the middle, new middle school that I'm going to now. And, you know, everybody was a good kid. I don't think in, you know, sixth, seventh grade, not too many kids are really making bad decisions at that point. Quite yet. Quite yet. It's on, you know, on the verge, on the brink of getting to that direction. And, uh, you know, I graduated middle school with a 3.8 GPA, and something went haywire during that summer. You know, I think I started smoking weed. I got introduced to weed for the first time. And, uh, you know, something, something... I can't pinpoint it. I don't remember exactly what it was and, you know, my first time smoking weed, you know, because there's a lot of drug use and a lot of alcohol involved, you know, over the next, you know, damn near 20 years. 
So I really don't even remember my first time getting high. All right. And I ended up going to six high schools. You know what I mean? Before I could even graduate, what would be eleventh grade? Um, I went to I went to my first high school, you know, Chatsworth High School, and I only had enough attendances for like not even half a semester by the end of the school year i was ditching every day you know doing all that stuff and i was just kicking it with the stoners i wasn't even involved with you know so you bring in weed and then all of a sudden your behaviors automatically change automatically so i mean automatically good like, kid to poor attendance to, absolutely so yeah. and this is where life starts to get real yeah you know, you know what i mean and this is where i'm starting to have to lie and and manipulate and you know i got really good at it really quick you know, the lying and the thieving and the manipulation, you know, I found a niche for it. Even to this day, I can, you know, manipulate somebody into doing something that they don't absolutely want to do. You know, I mean, I, I, it, it's, it's a curse, but, you know, at that time in my disease, it was definitely a skill set to have. For sure. But, uh, you know, I was able to uh, really get involved, uh, uh, you know, with the stoner crowd and, you know, just smoking weed, not doing anything crazy yet. And then... Uh, I messed up so bad that Chatsworth High School on the last day of school said that you're not welcome back. So every summer and winter vacation in between school, I was always going back to visit my family back, back in Indiana. And this time I went out to go visit and I didn't know that I didn't have a return trip home. Right. So next thing you know, I'm getting enrolled into school and here all of a sudden now here I am the outcast again. Back you know, in Indiana. Back in Indiana. I'm enrolled into school for my 10th grade year. Uh, uh, here I am again, the outcast. When I came out here to California, I was the outcast because right. I'm not a native here. You know what I mean? I'm just a country boy. I had a very thick accent, you know, talking like this. And, you know, that's that was... I never got ridiculed for it, but people always asked me where I was from, and I always felt, you know, somewhat different. Not necessarily in a negative light, but I always felt different, that I, right. you know, didn't maybe truly necessarily belong. Then when I went back to Indiana, now I'm the Cali boy. Right. And and everybody is like, oh, he's from California. All the girls loved you. All the guys hated you. Ex exactly. Yep. You know what I mean? And I actually, uh, there was a jock's girlfriend that just absolutely loved me. And I remember, and you know, but when I got to the school, it became a problem. And the jocks hated me because over this one chick that just had it for me. We'd walk the halls and talk together in between classes and whatnot. Well, one time, me and my stepbrother were sitting at the at the lunch table, and this is my first real, true act of violence. At that lunch table, the jocks surrounded my table, and they did the whole punking thing, hazing, whatever you want to call it. They took my milk, they smacked my cookie off my tray, or vice versa. And my stepbrother said, "Do it again, I dare you." And they did it again. And I, I sat there and I said, step away. And I removed everything from this little metal tray. And they didn't move. And I got up and I smacked this dude right across the face. And I broke his jaw in three places. Right. That was immediate term for being expelled. And this is my first six weeks of school there. So he was expelled, not you. You did the right thing, right? Well, <laughs> uh, I did the right thing in my moral code. But, you know, I'm the one that got expelled. Oh, no wonder I'm not doing so well in society. Right. <laughs> So uh, um, I actually got kicked out of the, the school district there, and if I wanted to go continue going to school, I had to go into Kentucky, but I had no means of transportation to do that. So I started working with my pop, and things started to get really well. I was welcome to come back on the next, next school year, but now because of my credits of ninth grade, and now I'm missing all my credits from 10th grade, I'm going to be walking into 11th grade with probably no, not yeah. even half of ninth grade credits. Right. So I'm falling really behind in school, and <clears throat> I just started working for my pop, and I'm actually very grateful that at least I started working for my pop because it taught me the work ethic that I have today. Right. You know what I mean? I am a very hard-working man today, and I always was, even through my disease. I worked all throughout my disease. You know what I mean? I mean, I was just loaded every day. But I still went to work and made money and still had side hustle and this and that. But Had to. Had to. Well, then I come back to visit my mom, and I had a return ticket to go back to Indiana, but it was my stepdad's 50th birthday party that summer, and my dad didn't even want me to come because he knew I wasn't going to go back home. All right. I came. My dad got very mad at me. This is actually where I was disconnected from my, from my pop for probably about a decade. 
and that one kind of stung because I was always really close with my pop. You know what I mean? I loved my pop. I missed my pop because I was never with him in Indiana. And the times that we did get to spend, you know, he'd take me to St. Louis. Every summer he took me to St. Louis, moved to Six Flags, went to opening day of the Cardinals. And my dad was very, very present in my life. And, you know, if you happen to see this pop, just know that I love you with all my heart. And uh, we do still have, we have a connection today. Once again, something went haywire there. I got, went to, you know, I came back here. I went to Cleveland, got kicked out for selling drugs. And then I went to Granada, got kicked out for throwing a book at a teacher because she told me to shut up. And then I went to uh, Stony Point. Then I went to West Granada. And then finally, they were just like, dude, you're done. When I threw the book at the teacher, they kicked me out of the school, school district, district again. Yeah. But I was able to go to two continue. I, I had a chance to go to continuation school. I got kicked out of one. They said that you can go to this one, but this is your last straw. You get kicked out of here. You're done completely. And I ended up getting kicked out of that second one. So, off. so then you know, I went back to work ethic, and uh, you know there was a chain of events that happened where on Y2K my house got robbed by all my middle school and high school buddies from California. I was able to have a little party at my house, and uh, these kids they. There was still Christmas presents underneath the tree. We hadn't even put them all away yet. And like these dudes robbed a safe out of my mom's, my mom and stepdad's bedroom. They took posters off my wall. They took my brand new clothes I just got. The you were there. there. I was in the house. Drunk, passed out. No, I was, I was coherent for the whole thing. But these guys, one by one, just started ransacking my house. Uh, and then I started seeing this suspect activity. Right. But it was everybody against me. And it literally was to the point to where I was sitting on the couch like, I don't even know what to do. Because if I act out on one of them, they're all going to beat my ass. Where's the fucking lunch tray when you needed it? You, right? You know what I mean? But I like, in that moment, that was my like first moment of like being like hopeless against other human beings you know what I mean like I just there was nothing I could have done to stop what was going on and even if I could the damage was already done and I was going to be reaping the repercussions of their actions All right. you know what I mean so then I took full rap you know what I mean I, I learned little by little that you know you don't tell you don't ask I was installed that in a very young age you know what I mean you don't tell and you don't ask and I took the rap for everything I told my parents I let them have it all you know what I mean? In spite, you know what I mean? For whatever reason, I came up with it. But I told him, I said, I gave it to him, and you're not going to, you know, press charges and this and that. And she knew who it was, but I took the rap, and my mom let me take the fall for it. And they took my TV away, my computer away, everything, and I was literally confined to my room. It was so like, your shit didn't get taken? No, my shit got taken, oh, too. Okay. You know what I mean? But, you know, not my TV and my computer and stuff, but, like, all my brand new clothes that I just got for Christmas. I mean, they took posters off my wall. Little knickknacks and stuff that I had. But welcome to the valley. Welcome to the valley. Searching for victims. You know what I mean? And then, and then that day, I was the victim. And uh, so then I started working at this little mom and pop restaurant. And this was my first exposure. And this is, you know, part of the reason why I became a chef is because I started. We went in. The, actually, the people that threw my stepdad's 50th birthday party had a restaurant in the valley. You know, off of uh, over there by the Target on Corbin and Plummer. Okay. Uh, or Corbin and Nordoff. And uh, we went, my mom said, you've been in the, you've been in the doghouse long enough, let me take you out to lunch. And this is about a month after, after New Year's. And I went into this restaurant, they had a help wanted sign on the door, my mom knew the owner, she said, my son needs a job, and this lady goes to the back, grabs an apron and two towels, she says, starts washing dishes. Right. I said, can I eat lunch first? And she said, no, you can earn your lunch. I said, whatever, good looking out, mom, you know what I mean? But I started washing dishes, and little did my mom know, but there were a couple fellas that worked there that were family of the mom and pop, cousin and, and, uh, and son. They ran the kitchen, and they were graffiti artists. You know what I mean? But in, in my mom's eyes, they were good dudes. So after working full-time all day every day, because I'm not able to go to school and this and that, um, I literally went in at 12 o'clock and I worked all the way up until close and cleared the dish pit and all that every night for like a year and a half. Then they actually made me a cook after a year and a half. They said they needed help in the kitchen. I said, get me out of here. <laughs> and then I started cooking and that was my first exposure to, to cooking in a restaurant. It was mom and pop. Nothing of what I'm doing today, but it was, it was my first bit of holding a knife professionally and this and that. Well, the dudes that ran the kitchen, they were really big graffiti artists. And they actually had a niche out. They asked me if I knew the guys that robbed me because there was a graffiti beef with them. Well, it just so happened to be that I had 
I knew what every single car that they drove. <laughs> right. I knew every single place that they lived. And I, now here I got these big homies that yeah, are about it. You know what yeah. I mean? And they're, they're like, well, you know, tell us where to go. And I said, sure thing. <laughs> got you. You know what I mean? So I, you know, I showed them we actually did some really bad damage to these dudes but uh, then i got really involved into what they were doing outside of you know hunting for people i got really involved into the graffiti scene and i became really good at it because i have a niche for drawing so when i would picked up a spray can and my homeboys were telling me and teaching me how to flare and put different tips on the cans and you can get a skinny line a fat line i actually blew up really big with graffiti and i put a name for myself in graffiti in the san fernando valley and I was from a very notorious crew, but we weren't the ones that were really hitting up, uh, you know, household neighborhoods, walls, and stuff like that. We tried to keep it mostly respectful and just to, to, to the public, but we disrespected the city in major ways. Billboards, rooftops, freeways, you know, that's that was our get down. Mainstream, I want, I want you to see my name if you're driving down the freeway, what have you. you know, all the big respectable spots, not the little curbs and this and that. But, um, you know, I ran and I did that for a very long time. And, you know, fast forwarding, by this time when I'm really deep into graffiti, I'm now enrolled in the culinary school. And I'm going to culinary school in Pasadena Monday through Friday, 8 to 2.30. And all throughout the night, you know, I was running graffiti. You know, I was running graffiti. Sometimes I was still in my, my not my, my white coat, but my checkered pants. Yeah. I'd be running graffiti in the middle of the night from having my outfit on from the morning. You know what I mean? I mean, we did it. We did it big, and we did it live. And then, you know, because we were so present in the graffiti scene that we actually grabbed onto a lot of haters. And there was a lot of people that were starting to cross us out. And now it becomes, you know, tagging wars, which it became so present that it actually turned into full blown tag banging. So. I know, like, in the county jail or in a state pen, if somebody crosses your name out, that means if they see you, it's on site. They're on going to try and take you out. Is this the same thing? Same, thing, same story? Same thing. You know I mean? It turned into, you know, we we were so big. They leave but, little, like, who they were? Oh, absolutely. Little you know what I mean? from yeah, it's like, you know, I got, I got my name blasted right there, and they come through with a squiggly line, and then they blast their name and their crew above. To, so now, know, if you guys should see each other seven later, and, and it's, and it's on site, and that, that whole thing turned into, you know, fist fighting to pulling pieces on each other, and, you know, I mean, in broad daylight. You know, Mason and Devonshire, me and another dude from Rival Crew, we were both sitting there shining pieces, and people were over there pumping gas. I mean, this this became a real thing. Was this the time of the cell phones? When, when was this? I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, this is like when you had the, the it's, going like, down. it's like when you had your first little Nokia. You know, so there was a filming game. No, okay. I, no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, definitely no smartphone, but it, it was uh, you know definitely a cell phone era. I mean, this had to be now probably like 2002, 2003. Or just no, nowadays you couldn't whip out a fucking butter knife no, without no, getting put on not. video. You know what I mean? And you know, get busted. And and it was and it was and it was stupid. You know what I mean? Because I put myself with how much, you know, and by this time now, my homeboys had given me all the right connection. I'm the youngster from the crew. Still to this day, I'm the last one to ever get in my crew. You know what I mean? So I was I was the, the, the youngster. So also I got... Also known as the books are closed. Yeah. And uh, I was the youngster. And, it, you know, a lot of... A lot of the work I put on my shoulders, so I was the one running the gun or running the drugs. You know, eventually you ended up running running some guns, and you know it was it was a very active time for me in my life. And you know, and mind you, I'm trying to go to culinary school. I'm I'm now officially into tag banging and running with guns and drugs, and and it got real heavy. And there was a time where cops were passing by my house. You know, rival rival. Taggers were driving past my house because I knew what kind of car they drove and they'd be creeping by in the middle of the night. Things got really, really scary for a minute. So when they, you know they're I mean? coming by to do what? Tag at your house or to get busy with no, you? No, it was probably it was, it, was, shootings, it was probably more of the tail end of what you were saying. Right, right. You know what I mean? Uh, so how did the cops get involved to know your name? As far as graffiti goes, it was never it was never a thing. But there was a couple of times where I'd done a you know I just just did a like drug deal or, or, or yeah, you know yeah, what I mean, and, and I would on. get pulled over or you know I don't think I ever really got told on because they never came at me with heavy ammunition about what I was doing. They just knew I was up to no good. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? Wrong place, wrong time. Sure. And uh, you know, sp suspect behavior. Right. You know what I mean? And my car would get tossed up all the time, but you know, 
my homeboys from my crew taught me how to be a really good criminal. And this is why that today I never saw a day in prison. I mean, I've been in and out of the county jail, but I've never caught a heavy enough beef to be sent off to prison. All of my charges have been driving related. You know, driving on a suspended license, DUI, right, second guy. DUI, <laughs> third DUI. But those, those, that's the extent of my on the books criminal career. But if they knew the truth, I'd probably be sitting, you know, I'd probably be sitting somewhere for a long time. You know what I mean? Licking shots in the streets and doing this. I mean, I, I've done it all. I ran graffiti, guns, and drugs. And anything that you can wrap your head around that is involved in that life, I've probably done it. And that's not to showboat or nothing. That's just a fact. Right. You know what I mean? I've, I've done it all. And, um, and then I think my saving grace was uh, the day I finished culinary school, my parents actually sold the house. They had a movie. I left to go to culinary school my last day. I left in the morning from my house in Chatsworth, and then I went home to my house in Newbury Park. It was a lot more mellow out there, you know what I mean? But I saw another very, uh, I saw a great thing about, coming from a hustler mentality, I saw a great thing about Thousand Oaks West Lake. Victims. <laughs> Tons of them, dude. I mean, paying high, I was still running to the valley every day and picking up, you know, merchandise, and I was selling it for top dollar to all these rich kids, so I was making bread. Right. You know what I mean? I was making some really good money with them. Well, you know, long story short, you know, that's, that's about as, as, as extensive, which it's pretty extensive, and leaving out some other details, um, you know, of my criminal history. But then on November 21st of 2009, I caught my third DUI. And uh, I bailed out. And while I was sitting in county again, and I knew that this time, especially being in Ventura County, it was going to be a heavy hit. You know what I mean? As far as, as far as looking at possible prison time over this one. Did they threaten you with that? Oh, I would, my, my initial offer was three years upstate because I got a hit and run, um, felony evasion, and, and the DUI. You know, I pulled over, got out of the car, and they said, you know, I can shoot you. Or a stun gun, whatever. You know what I mean? I was like, you know what, dude? I'm caught, dude. I'm drunk. I'm not even going to you know, deal with this mess. Plus, I smoke too much to run that far. <laughs> right.